So the world has declared war on the truth. And we find, for example, when the missionaries have gone to India to conquer India with the British Empire, they've infiltrated into the educational systems and they started studying in order to put doubts into the minds and the hearts of the Muslims. So they started reading and writing about the Qur'an, looking at the history of the Qur'an, reading our hadith books, and trying to sometimes draw some parallels, for example, between what happened to the Bible in history and what happened to the Qur'an, and try to use some of the same terms to say pretty much to the Muslims, well, you guys are saying this about our Bible, but we're saying this about your Qur'an. So you shouldn't really say anything because we can say the same thing. However, due to ignorance, and we must admit that as Muslims, we are very far from what we used to be. This is a, just a blunt reality. I mean, <laughs> I'm sitting here giving you a lecture, and I'm the least knowledgeable of the people. But the thing is that there's not too many people of knowledge who are around. And even if they are, they cannot communicate properly, for example, or express sometimes, except in a certain language. And even if they can, maybe they're not allowed. There's different, too many factors, subhanAllah. Anyhow, as we know very well, that knowledge will be lifted towards the end of time. And some of the scholars have commented on the hadith, saying that it's by the death of scholars, by the death of people who have knowledge. So people have studied the Qur'an, and they have attacked the Qur'an, they have attacked the hadith, as we discussed last weekend, about the hadith the narrations of Prophet Muhammad and what they are. So, what is the Qur'an first and foremost and why is it so important? Well, the Qur'an, when we say Qur'an has actually many different names. Qur'an, Mus'haf, Suhuf, different things, okay? Al-Furqan, Al Al there's many names of the Qur'an. Qur'an is what is being called. Its, its name is Quran in the, in, the, in the actual scripture. However, when we look at the book, the Quran, this is the Kitab. This is the Suhuf, or the book. And the Quran is in it. This is the speech of Allah verbatim. Allah is speaking word by word. He is saying these things word by word. And it's recorded, it's been preserved in the book as it's reached us till today. But how? Since that time when Angel Jibreel said to Prophet Muhammad Iqra, how has the Quran been preserved and reached us till today? First and foremost, we need to understand that Prophet Muhammad did not write. He didn't know how to write. And actually, no one ever no one ever, till recently, some people have tried to dig around to accuse him that he is the one who has written it. However, we look in the Qur'an and we look in the history of Islam and we don't find any of his peers accusing him of penning it down. But they have accused him of making it up. And we have till today, people have followed. And what's very interesting actually, brothers and sisters, about the phenomenon of people are not sincere and they're trying to dig for doubts here and there, is that they'll use the same arguments. And no match, no matter how much you try to reply to them, they'll still go back to the same argument. So we find that today, people like Richard Bell and Montgomery Watt, some of the Orientalists who have taken it upon themselves to write against the Quran, even though sometimes in quite a neutral way, it seems, with hidden, hidden agendas. But we find some of the same things. Until today, recently someone sent me a message asking an interesting question as to why is the reference to Mary in the Quran, Ya Ukhta Harun? Why did they say that? It's like, don't they know that this is not the daughter of Aaron? Right? Because actually, if we look throughout the, the history of Islam and the history of scriptures, this is a very common usage to
to attribute. For example, we are Bani Adam. We're son of Adam, right? Are we Bani Adam? Well, literally, not really. But it is a sense of usage of the word. So, the children of Abraham, and so on. But you know what's funny? That when I looked at this question, it's a question that's recently been published by some of the missionaries. Then I did a little research. And it's funny because one of the companions of Prophet Muhammad came to him from one of the, from Bilad al-Sham, I believe, the, the Christian area at that time, and with the same question. The, the Jews and Christians are saying that you're saying, Ya Ukhtar Harun. Okay? Or, or sister of Aaron, sorry. Not daughter of Aaron. Or sister of Aaron. So, what's wrong? Like, do you not know that this is not the sister of Aaron or so on and so forth? And he laughed and he explained to him. The hadith explains, no, actually, Bani Israel, and even we, they used to attribute, they used to say this kind of thing to show someone's high status. This is 1400 years ago, and today, so it's been answered. And actually, you find even in those scriptures the same thing occurring, but they're still insisting on bringing the same issue up. This is because of insincerity. So, how does this relate to what we're talking about? It does a lot because. Someone might come to you one, at one point and say certain things about the Qur'an. And you might not know. So you need to know. You need to know, as a Muslim, certain basics of Islam. Why? Because you don't know when the day will come when your faith will be tested. When your faith will be tested, and you should hate to go back to kufr like you hate being thrown in hellfire. As Prophet Muhammad said, told us. And you should really hate it. And you should really pray with the dua that Prophet Muhammad himself used to pray. Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. O Allah, the one who flips the hearts, please keep my heart stay straight or thabbit yani firm on your faith, on the truth. This is Prophet Muhammad وسلم, praying. We should learn this dua and pray every day. Who says that we're going to wake up as Muslims? Muslims. We know the hadith of Prophet Muhammad that towards the end of time, a person will go to sleep as a believer and wake up as this believer. And wake up as a believer and go to sleep as this believer. Or the hadith where holding on to your deen will be like the hot, holding a hot coal in your hand. You can't hold it. People leave the deen faster than a an arrow leaves the bow, and so on and so forth. And we need to believe this. And we need to be scared of this. Because for myself, I cannot see anything past this life other than Islam. There's no purpose in this life if there's no Islam. Right? I was just coming down from the street. I had to meet some family in one of the areas. And it's a very, and there's no masjid in the area. People are living in Ghafla. They don't understand what is the purpose of life. They think they're safe. What if a tsunami is going to come over that from the water and cover and take everything upside down? Are they ready for that? Are we ready for that? How can people be so oblivious to look around? The sun is setting. إِنَّ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتِ and these are ayah. This is a sign from Allah. The sun is setting. Showing that something ends and something begins. Don't you know that your life is going to end? And then something else will begin? And people are sitting there. Not worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. Playing tennis like there's no tomorrow. Enjoying. No masjid. Adhan Maghrib is going. Or it's not going. Actually, you can't hear. But I can tell by the time. And people are just waving their cars and their motorcycles and blah, 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 blah. Allah Akbar. Who can guarantee they're going to live till tomorrow? So we should be very careful about our faith. And how do you defend your faith? First and foremost, of course, after the tawfiq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make it dua to Allah. But another way is by knowing, having knowledge. And the most important thing that we have in our deen, in this life, in the Qur'an, is the Qur'an. 
This is the proof. This is the biggest proof for Islam. So when people attack this, we need to be ready. We need to understand. And actually, if we don't know, if people bring some new information, this will actually hurt us. Why? It's not because it might be true or not. It's because we don't know. It's because we don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُ فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا I mean, do they not ponder the Qur'an? Has it been from other than Allah? Meaning people made it, people make it, made it up. They would have found in it many, many contradictions. اختلاف كثير. Allah has told us over and over and over again that this Qur'an is guarded. Alif Lam ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه this is the book there is no doubt in it and I remember subhanallah the brother told me of one of his friends just today I was talking to him he quoted to me this verse subhanallah he said this Indonesian guy went to Saudi with a big budget as a Christian missionary to convert the Saudis to Christianity and he went as a cleaner in a hospital imagine undercover so with a big budget so the first thing he started doing, he said, he took a copy of the Qur'an to find something, to attack it. And he opened it to Surah Al-Baqarah. The first, you know, right after Al-Fatiha. And he's like, I'm going to find some contradictions. Alif I mean, this is a book, there's no doubt in it. He said that it's uh, as if someone slapped him in the face. Like punched him in the nose. This is exactly what he says. He said, I felt that someone slapped me in my face. He's like, here I am, thinking right now, I'm going to find something. And the first thing I read is that there's no, no doubts in this Qur'an. He said, I read the whole Qur'an, then I read Sahih Bukhari, then I read Sahih Muslim, then I became Muslim by myself. And now he's in Indonesia, is in the Philippines, I believe, giving da'wah. SubhanAllah. So this Qur'an actually is something miraculous. It's mujiz. So let's look at the history now. This is all we hear today. I know I kind of give a long introduction, but it's very important so that we build our spirits and we understand what the Quran is. Actually, Prophet Muhammad used to call some of his companions to write the verses for him. He did not write. What did they write it upon? They write it upon leather, bones, different leaves, and so on. Paper was not readily available at that time. So they used to write it. At the same time, Prophet Muhammad used to teach the companions, and they used to memorize. And the companions, like even Omar Khattab, and other companions narrate that they didn't pass on, go beyond 10 verses or even less before they implemented these verses. They understood the verses, they have memorized the verses, they have acted upon the verses. So the verses were being, pay attention, written down and memorized. Okay? They're written down and memorized by the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had these words imprinted in him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he used to call different companions, they used to write it and so on and so forth. In Mecca, it was not as prolific as Medina, and Medina became even more prolific, but basically it used to be written down on different parchments and so on and so forth. We want to contrast here really fast with, for example, the Bible. Okay? And we know that the first written documents, scholars differ a little bit over the dates, but about 80, 80 after Jesus. And these are some of the letters of Paul. Not the Gospels, some of the letters of Paul. And we can go into a deeper understanding of why and how, and how that impacted even the writing of the Gospels, the four synoptic Gospels. 
However, the Quran was written 